We're going to start off in Exodus chapter 1, verse 13 through 16. If you have your Bibles, you know you can always grab Bibles in the back. If you, that's, we, we told our, I told myself we was never going to go to this. Because I knew this was what was going to happen. We were going to become dependent upon the screen. Yeah. And we would no longer hear the rustling of pages yeah. as we turned, Lord help us, digital Bibles. Although I do like my digital commentaries and Bibles. Exodus chapter 1, verses 13 through 16. So we're going to be skipping around a lot. I just wanted to give Sandy a heads up there. All right, here we go. Starting in verse 13. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage, in mortar and in brick, and in all manner of service in the field. All their service, wherein they made them serve, was with rigor. And the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of one was Shifra, and the name of the other was Pua. And he said, When you do the office of a midwife, to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools. That means they were about to give birth. If it be a son, then you shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. Exodus chapter 2 verses 23 through 25. And it came to pass in process of time that the king of Egypt died and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage. And they cried. And their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. And God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel. And God had respect unto them. Exodus chapter 3 verses 7 through 10. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows and I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large, meaning a big, like a big open field and signifies freedom, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. Unto the place of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, and have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Exodus chapter 3, verses 11 through 21. And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God upon this mountain. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shall you say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me unto you. This is my name forever. This is my memorial unto all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together. Say unto them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, appeared unto me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen that which is done to you in Egypt. And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt unto the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites unto a land flowing with milk and honey. And they shall hearken to your voice and thou shalt come thou and the elders of Israel unto the king of Egypt. And you shall say unto him, the Lord God of the Hebrews has met with us. And now let us go, we beseech thee, three days journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. And I am sure 
that the king of Egypt will not let you go. No, not by a mighty hand. And I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in the midst thereof. And after that, he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And it shall come to pass that when ye go, ye shall not go empty. Exodus 4 verses 1 through 10. And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. For they will say, The Lord has not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said unto him, What is that in your hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. And the Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thine hand, and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand, and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand, that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob has appeared unto them, unto you. And the Lord said furthermore unto him, Put now thine hand into thy bosom. And he put his hand into his bosom, and he took it out. Behold, his hand was leprous as snow. And he said, Put your hand into your bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again and plucked it out of his bosom. And behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe also these two signs, neither hearken unto your voice, that you shall take of the water of the river, and pour it upon the dry land. And the water which you take out of the river shall become blood upon the dry land. And Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto, my, unto your servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 5, verses 1 through 8. And afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. And they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days journey into the desert and sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. And the king of Egypt said unto them, wherefore do you, Moses and Aaron, let the people from their works Get you unto your burdens. And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land now are many, and you make them rest and you make them rest from their burdens. And Pharaoh commanded the same day the taskmasters of the people and their officers, saying, You shall no more give the people straw to make brick as you did before. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. And the tail or the amount of the bricks which they did make before, you shall lay upon them. You shall not diminish aught or even a little bit thereof, for they be idle. Therefore they cry, saying, let us go and sacrifice to our God. Exodus chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. Then the Lord said unto Moses, now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand shall he let them go. And with a strong hand shall he drive them out of his land. And God spoke unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty, or also El Shaddai. But by my name Jehovah, the promise-keeping God, I was not known to them. And I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage. And I have remembered my covenant. Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians and I will rid you out of their bondage and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments and I will take you to be my people and I will be to you a God and you shall know that I am the Lord your God which brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians and I will bring you in unto the land concerning the which
which I did swear to give it to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and I will give it to you for a heritage. I am the Lord. And Moses spoke so unto the children of Israel, but they hearkened not unto Moses for anguish of spirit and for cruel bondage. The message that the Lord has given me this morning is make me intolerant, Lord. And what I mean by that is, Lord, make me intolerant of bondage. Make me intolerant of sin. Make me intolerant of the ways of the world and make me hungry to cry out for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just pray, Lord God, that you would use me this morning as a simple vessel, Lord, broken, marred clay, Lord, which is what you've chosen to do, Lord, to the foolishness of preaching to confound the wise. Holy Spirit, I welcome you here this morning and pray that you would be the preacher, and that you would be the teacher, and that you would speak what you desire spoken. Holy Spirit, we need your help to solidify this word, Lord, because every single person in this place from the preacher to the youngest person here, Lord, needs to hear what you would have to say because this is still the plight of your people today. We just want to give you glory and honor in Jesus' name. You know, here's the people of God making bricks for Pharaoh. They're making bricks for Pharaoh so that Pharaoh can build monuments to, for himself. So that he can receive glory in the land. But all the while that they're making bricks for Pharaoh, they're not building the, or pr producing glory for God upon this earth. They aren't being able, to, they aren't allowed to live in service for the king of kings. And slowly but surely the enemy is stealing from them and he's killing them. And ultimately his plan is to destroy them. God, you got to understand something that the enemy of God wants to eradicate the seed of God from off this earth. He wants to remove the seed of God and he wants to remove the voice of God from off this earth. That's part of the reason if you've said yes to Jesus that you find yourself in situations time and again where the pressures of life begin to weigh you down and the burdens of life begin to weigh you down because the enemy wants to frustrate you and he wants to make you quit. He wants to cause you to shut your mouth. Listen, God's plan is not for you and I to live under this burden and to be working for Pharaoh and to be toiling day in and day out and, and to be living life in such a way that it becomes bitter and frustrating. No, God wants to be the joy that's inside of your heart. He wants to be the king of your heart. Amen. He wants to be the mountain that you run to. He wants to be the fountain that you drink from. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, after generations of all this abuse, they've begun to develop a slave, a slave's mindset. I don't think I can really beat that point home long enough. A slave's mindset. Oh, this is just the way life's going to be. This is this is what normal life looks like. Come on. Good. This feels good. I like this. Even after the Lord delivers them, how many times do we have to say it? They look backwards and they're like, oh, the melons and the leeks and the garlics, as though they wanted to go back and to be a slave. As though they wanted to go back and make bricks for Pharaoh after they found themselves in the wilderness, after God had delivered them with a mighty hand, for some reason unknown to even you and I, who still find ourselves doing the same kind of thing, they wanted to go back. It's like, how quickly do we forget that where we used to be? It's a slave, a slave's mindset. You continue to live a particular way for so long and you think that this is normal. Let me tell you something. Normal Christianity is not to live under bondage. Normal Christianity is not to find yourself from one bad situation into a next situation. Because yes, the earth is fallen. And yes, sin is rampant upon the earth. And yes, constantly traps are being set for the child of God. But God wants again, and he keeps speaking to me in my personal time with him. He says, you are in Christ Jesus seated in heavenly places. The Lord keeps wanting to remind me that the, that the view from up here is a whole lot different than the view from down there. And if you'll trust me, I'll give you eyes like the eagle. If you'll trust me, I'll give you ears that you can hear. If you'll trust me, I'll speak to your spirit and I'll give you wisdom. Amen. And I'll light your path and I'll be a lamp unto your feet and I'll show you the way that you should go. But you're going to have to trust me. Amen. You're going to have to trust me no matter what your situation looks like. You know, another thing I'm starting to realize too, because sometimes maybe you're saying, but preacher, you keep talking about bondage and you keep talking about sin and I'm not in it. Well, how Hallelujah, brother and sister. You have arrived. But you got somebody that you know that is, if you really even 
are free from your bondage and sin. I'm just being real this morning. Amen. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that you aren't. That's between you and Jesus. That's right. yeah, he knows. He knows what's going on inside that head and that heart of yours. Right. But even if you happen to have received the freedom that the word of God promises, because there is a freedom there. Come on, brothers. Amen. Come on, sisters. There's a freedom there. The problem isn't the Lord. The problem isn't His Word. The problem is us. Amen. But even if you have received that freedom that you have, that the Word of God proclaims you can have, you know somebody, you know some kind of situation that's closely connected to you that keeps trying to weigh you down, keeps trying to burden you. It might be the people that you work with. It might be your family members. It might be your friends. I don't know what it is. But nevertheless, there's a situation that keeps trying to burden you and keeps trying to frustrate you. And I'm here to tell you something. Those situations may never go away completely. That's right. I'm resolved to the fact that, they, that, that this world is not going to be perfected until Jesus, the perfect one, comes back. But I will tell you one thing. The view from up there is a whole lot different than the view down here. And he brings a peace that surpasses understanding. And he wants to get us to a place where we'll learn to trust him in spite of the situations, in spite of the circumstances. we got to quit believing that the world's got something figured out. Listen, the world is the ones that, that are in Egyptian bondage. The world is, the, is Egypt. This is all they know. This is their culture. And we're going to sit here and we're going to rub shoulders with the world for the rest of our life. In our workplace, wherever it is that we go. And they're going to keep trying to convince us that what they have is what we need. And as long as we keep on holding on to what they have and thinking it's what we need, we're going to find ourselves in the same plight and situation that the children of God in this story find themselves in. Generations after generations of this abuse, they've developed the slaves Mindset and enslavement to sin has and always will do the same to God's people. It places them under bondage and it begins to oppress them. The enemy wants to oppress God's people. He wants to cause so much a weight to be burdened upon your back that you begin to walk heavy. Yeah. It, it, becomes, it becomes a burden on your back so heavy that you can't tote it yourself. And becomes, you become miserable under that constant pressure weighing you down where life becomes bitter. No wonder so many people feel like life is miserable and frustrating. Who wants to be a slave? Who wants to live all their lives in bondage? But emotions and anguish from the bondage someday can result in a desire for freedom. I want to tell you that this morning. You got to understand something. The emotional distress. From the frustration of day after day of living this slave's mindset can and if you will hold on will result in a situation where you will get sick and tired. I can't say it loud enough. I can't say it with enough passion. We need to be sick and tired of feeling like and accepting the way that life is as though it's normal. No, it's not normal. That's not what God has planned for us. God wants to pick us up. He wants to elevate us. And He wants us to be able to walk in His power Amen. and in His strength. And someday those emotions and that anguish from the bondage can result in a desire for freedom. Listen, it's got to start off as a desire. Right. Just a desire that's brewing in that side of that heart to the point where one day you'll whisper it out, you'll murmur it out, you'll groan it out with great groaning and sighs and a cry from deep down on the inside of your soul as you cry out to God. He will hear it. He will respect it. He will look upon that situation and he will begin to move. Thank you, Lord. Listen, sin has power behind it. These taskmasters, you know, that's what the word means. It means oppressors. These taskmasters. You got, it's not God's will that there be taskmasters in your life. I can start naming off a bunch of taskmasters, whatever they are. It's these things that keep on trying to say that they keep putting that pressure on you. I mean, in some people's lives, listen, I know I've been there. I'm going to talk about it. it drugs and alcohol. Yes. It, 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 loneliness causes us to result to, to, to look for relationships. Yeah. Come on, somebody, help me out here. I'm just being real single women in the church, single men in the church, lonely. Or you could be married and still be lonely. And you feel like, oh, man, nothing's working for me. Not, I'm not happy where I am. And so you begin to venture out because the next thing you know, no, it's a taskmaster. It's an oppressor. It's another way to lay another burden on your back. It's a lie from the enemy. Contrary to God's word. Whenever you step outside of God's word and you begin to operate contrary to God's word, the next thing you know, you're opening up a door for more 
oppression to be laid upon your back. Not freedom and liberty. No, you got to know what the word of God says and you got to trust what the word of God says. And by the grace of God, he'll give you the strength that you need to walk according to his will. And if you'll walk according to his will, you'll begin to see a little bit different. You'll begin to see from a different perspective. You'll begin to hear his word. You'll know the voice of your father. And when he speaks to you, yes. it'll yes. encourage you. In your wall, but these taskmasters, they never go away. I just named some of them. I don't know. Anything that can provide for you a momentary escape from your reality and it doesn't bring you freedom from God is, a, is a, as far as I'm concerned, it's a taskmaster. Some, sometimes it's watching TV. Sometimes it's listening to music that's ungodly that pulls you away from the presence of God and brings you to some other escape. Listen to me, child of God. Don't get mad at me. I'm trying to say that the enemy is constantly providing other avenues of escape. You know what I'm talking about? Shake your head like that. Yeah. It's an escape. It's an escape route. And it's a lie from the enemy. And it's never going to bring you to the place that God wants to bring you. It's just going to hold you there. It's an oppressor. It's going to weigh you down. It's just going to hold you in the same spot. It has to be something that he does for you or me specifically. Or else, you know what? You will never know him for yourself. Right. You're never going to know him for yourself. You're just going to know him. He, who is he? Come on, Moses. Tell us who he is. Well, he said he's the I am. I'm the I am that I am. I'm the one that was here from the beginning, and I'll be the one that's still here whenever it all burns up. I am, you can also tell him this, because maybe they'll get a hint now. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They knew me by name. Yeah. Listen to me. Sometimes he's just the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in your life. Sometimes he's just my mom and my daddy's God. But he needs to show up for you in your life, amen, so that you will know him by name for yourselves. And sometimes you find yourself in these situations. You're like, how in the world did I end up in this spot? How did I end up in this bondage? How did I end up in a place where these taskmasters have taken me to on this journey? And I find myself oppressed. I find myself depressed. And I don't know. Let me tell you something. God's just orchestrating the circumstance. God knows exactly where you are. He knows how many hairs you have on your head. He's orchestrating a circumstance and a situation so that he can deliver you out. Once he delivers you out, guess what's going to happen? You're going to know him by name. He will no longer just be the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but he'll be the God of Angela. He'll be the God of Shelley. He'll be the God of Wade. He'll be the God of Gail. He'll be your God, and you will know him by name. And it's going to be a closeness in a relationship. You'll be able to know and trust yeah, that he is who he says he is. He's not just the God that Sister Touch said he was. He's a God that's revealed himself to me. Hallelujah. Oh, she tried to tell me about him. The other preacher tried to tell me about him, but I got to know him for myself. Can't be the God that the preacher Matt told you. It got to be your God. I'll tell you about him every time you show up over here because that's what I want to do. I just want to exalt Jesus. Let him be exalted. Let man be made a liar. Yeah. Let the truth of God be spoken so that Jesus can be exposed and revealed because he's worthy. Hallelujah. He has to do something for you. Amen. He's the God of the promise. Amen. Amen. Numbers 23 and 19 says that God is not a man that he should lie. If he said it, he will do it. Yeah. If he spoke it, he will make it good. He is the God. Amen. Of the promise. I don't know if the promise has lingered in your life, but I'm here to tell you, you got to keep on holding on. Amen. He is the God of the promise. So if he said he wants his people to be free so that they can worship him, then that's what he means. Yeah. He has a plan of deliverance. Hallelujah. No matter how impossible it appears, God is greater than our situations. Yeah. He's greater than the power of sin. There is victory in God's power. i got to tell you that this morning. You are going to listen to me. Whatever the stronghold is in your life, don't listen to the preacher out there that's lying to you that all you got to do is just go up to the front and get your hands laid. Now, there ain't nothing wrong with going up to the front. Let the man of God, let the sister of God lay their hands on you and, and pray for you and ask God to... to, 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 to move in your life and to deliver you. But listen, it's not that's not where victory comes from. Oh, if you get a revelation of where victory comes from in that moment in time, praise God for that. 
But it's also not in you just reading more and praying more and going to church more. Or you like, oh, I ain't getting nothing out of this church, so I'm going to go find another church. You're going to find out that until you come to the realization that God holds victory over sin and situations in his hand, and until you begin to believe that for the way that it's written, it's not going to be yours, Amen. brothers and sisters. But it's there and it's waiting the whole time. It's written and God has already proven it. And Jesus rose from the dead in fulfillment and completion of it. Hallelujah. It's a completed work. It's a finished work. And you and I need to believe it. And we need to grab hold of it. And we need to never let it go. Oh, let it be something that we cling to and that we never let go of it. Just like the woman with the issue of blood, when she clung to the garment, amen, she held on to it because she was hopeless yeah. in her situation. Nobody else could help her. How many times have people tried to help amen. you? Even people of God that love God and you like, you know, they keep trying to help me. No, because guess what? It can't be the God of Robert. It's got to be the God of you. It's got to be your God. God wants you to grab a hold yes. of him. Amen. When God says, let go, many times Satan holds on tighter. Just like I just told you, you need to hold on to God tight, to hold on to the hem of his garment. Guess what? Wake up call. When God says, let go, Satan grabs hold and he wants to hold on tighter. He's just like Pharaoh. You think he's going to let you go easy? Oh, no. And listen, you got to understand something. God is allowing those things to happen. Yeah. When you find yourself frustrating, you know, one time there was this old boy. He came to one of the Bible studies. Well, y'all might remember him, James Falls. And the Lord had given me a message. I don't know what I said. He said, dude, after that message, he said, I just felt like I was like God was in my heart kicking boxes around. <laughs> just kicking boxes. Because he just felt like he was frustrated because all this, because the Lord was exposing things in his life. And, the, and, and you know, in our mindset, we sit back and we act like we're cool. Oh, man, I got this, bro. Right. I got this. I don't know what you're talking about, preacher. I've been having this. Oh, yeah? Well, you think that God done, done forgot the little thing that he whispered in your ear five years ago and you still holding on to that thing? No, he's going to start kicking boxes around in your heart. He's going to start kicking boxes around in my heart. He's going to start cleaning house and he's going to start revealing and showing to you and what you need to do in order to get things right. That's how the Lord works. That's how the message of the cross works. It's like an x-ray in the midst of the heart. And he wants to reveal. This ain't the preacher talking to you this morning. This is the God that loves you and died for you and set you free. Amen. That went to the cross for you and shed his blood for you. That's who's talking to you this morning. God wants to set you free. And he will kick some boxes around. And he will show you what's really on the inside of your heart. He will reveal to you and in your, the thoughts of your mind, the thoughts of your heart, and the things that are contrary to the word of God. Okay. Lord, help us as your people to let you kick them boxes around. Yes, to begin to expose the things that are on the inside of us, the motives of our heart, the plans of our yes. heart, the things that are contrary yes. to your will, Lord. Show us your heart, yes. Lord. You were meek and humble and lowly of heart. And you said that if we would come unto you, we would find rest for our weary souls. Lord, help us yes. to trust in you. You know, it's crucial that God's people learn about and experience God's power for themselves. It's so important that they know because as soon as God begins to reveal to the heart that he will deliver and the child of God hears it or feels it like Pharaoh, again, Satan is going to try to hold on tighter. And many times before things get better, they will only get worse. Lord, help us to see that in the spirit. Lord, help us to hold on to your will. Lord Amen. God. And sometimes as the enemy starts holding on with everything he has in the physical, I'm just telling you right now, it starts to pile up. You understand what I'm saying? It starts to pile up. <laughs> More bills, less money. Come on. More bricks, less straw. More work, less time. Everything becomes so oppressive that there surely seems no way out. But it's at that moment that God will show who he is right when it seems impossible because he is the God of the promise. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, that deliverance will come immediately, but the repercussions of the decisions that we've made That's takes right. time to allow God to get us where we need. He Amen. needs to get us. We make decisions. I'm just saying this is just one example. Financially, I'm about to move on with my message. You ready? Financially. 
We find ourselves because sometimes it's like it's not drugs, it's not alcohol, it's not relationships anymore. No, preacher, I got me. I, I don't. I don't do drugs no more. I don't drink. I don't even. I'm not even addicted to nicotine anymore. Got me a wife. Got me a husband. I'm. I'm good. I'm happy with where I am. Maybe sometimes financially though, we still ain't got it figured out. Come on now, the preacher can take some wisdom in this area. I don't care how much money you make. I have learned that you could still outspend yourself. Alan Iverson ain't got a dime in his pocket from the last time I heard. I don't know if that's a problem for you, but that's a problem for me. That dude made hundreds of millions of dollars, and he still ain't got a dime in his pocket today. You can outlive, you can live outside your means no matter how much money you have. Britney Spears literally used to charter a jet to go back to some coffee shop that she liked in New York or vice versa just to get her a latte. And goodness gracious, man. And sooner or later, if you keep living your life that way, Mike Tyson gave away all the Rolls Royces and Bentleys till he ain't had nothing left. Yeah. And all I'm trying to say is, is that financially, this is just one example, you can find yourself in a situation where you make decisions a certain way, and then God will deliver you from that slavery mindset where you thought that buying something or spending money was going was gonna to be the little escape hatch that you were looking for, and now you're left with all this mountain of debt. Well, guess what? Sooner or later, you got to... You got to stand upright and you got to realize where you were wrong. And now you got to start trusting God as you begin to walk through that mountain and that pile of that oppression. Trusting God every every step of the way that he will deliver you. Because look, yeah, can he cause some man of God or woman of God to drop the amount of money in your pocket so that you can pay all your bills? I'm sure he can. And he's done it before. But many times when he does it that way, guess what? Five years later, you're right back in the same spot that you were in. God wants to do a work on the inside of our heart to where we become convinced that he is God and that he's everything that we need. I don't know if that works for you or not, but that's the only message I know how to preach. I know that that is what God has put in my heart. Even though I don't always get it right, I know that that's what the Lord is telling me, that I am everything you need, Matt. Your whole purpose in this life, come on, somebody, help me out here. Your whole purpose in this life was not for you to be a better nurse practitioner, and I can't even play golf, but in the end, when you retire, play golf till you die, or not to be the best teacher, or not to be the best this, or not to be the best that. No, your whole purpose on this life was to give me your Life and wherever I put you to bring glory to my Amen. name. That's what your purpose is. And faster you get a hold of that revelation, brothers and sisters, the whole lot better off you and I will be. That won't fly in most churches. I'm going to tell you right now, you go on and try to preach that way in most churches. I'm not saying that there's no other churches preaching that. That's not what I'm saying. I've sat in services before where, where people apologize for talking about personal evangelism. Because people were squirming in their seats. I'm here to tell you that if you can't get a revelation of this, that Jesus wants to live in you and he wants to live through you. He wants to speak to you and he wants to speak through you. He wants your life to bring him glory on this earth. And that's your whole purpose here. Amen. 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 Not so that you can have your best life now. No. He's going to give you your best life now so you can give it back to him as a sacrifice yeah. so that you can get some jewels for your crown. So that guess what? When you get up there and you got your crown full of jewels, you know what you're going to do with it? You're going to take it off and you're going to lay it at the feet of your king. Because he is worth Hallelujah. God wants to set his people free. But the question that I had here, do his people want to be free? Do his people want to worship him? He's yeah. waiting to hear it, church. He's waiting to hear it come out of our own mouths that he is what we want. So here's some observations from the text. You ready? Point number one, Satan wants to kill the seed. Look at verse 16, Exodus. Uh, I guess it was Exodus chapter one. Yeah, Exodus chapter one, verse 16. Exodus chapter one. Verse 16, Satan wants to kill the seed. He said, when you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then you shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. Listen, John 10, 10 says this, that the thief cometh not but to kill and to steal and to destroy. But I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Jesus came to die on the cross. Listen, People lie, oh man, all that preacher down the road over there talks about it's the cross because the cross is the connection to life for you. The cross is the key that opens the door so that grace can flow to you. You need grace from the Holy Ghost in order for you to be able to live. The Holy Spirit brings life. Who you, where you think you're going to get life from? 
from? You gonna read about it in a book somewhere? Yeah, you will. In the book of life, you're gonna read about life. Listen, the Holy Spirit wants to give you life. Amen. The enemy wants to steal, kill, and destroy yes, from you. Right. Jesus wants to bring you abundant life. See, to, to be destroyed means to be lost, to render useless, to completely abolish or put an end to something. See, the same spirit that drove Herod to kill all those boys that were the age of Jesus is the same spirit that wanted these boys killed. And it's the same spirit that wants to kill the Jesus on the inside of you. Romans 8.15 says this. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption Whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Listen, when you got saved, the Spirit of God came to live on the inside of you. That's Jesus in you. The enemy wants to kill that seed on the inside of you. He wants to frustrate you to the point where you become where you're ready to quit. But I'm here to tell you this. You're no longer a slave. You can call on your father. He waits for you. He wants to hear your voice. He wants to set you free. You no longer have to live under a spirit of fear and bondage and be told what you must do by your enemy. You no longer have to obey the lies of Satan. You can call on him and he will rush to you and he will bring deliverance to you. Amen. Pharaoh said, kill all the boys. The boys represented the seed of God's plan. Through the seed of Israel would come Messiah. Through Messiah would come life. Listen, in order for Satan's plans to work, he thinks his plans are going to work. He thinks he's going to win in the end. I'm telling you, he's that deceived. That's why sin will do such a good job of deceiving you. It's got the offer of deception deceived. He literally he thinks he's going to win. In order for Satan's plans to work, he has to try to kill the life of God in you because you are the seed of God. And in order for God's work to go forward, it must go forward in you. And what I mean by that is it must go forward in his people. He needed the nation of Israel to give us Jesus and Jesus gave birth to the church and you are the church. And now Satan wants to destroy you the same way that he wanted to destroy Israel, the same way that he wanted to destroy Jesus, because you are the seed of God in this earth and in you is the light of God on this earth. And through you, God wants to shine his glory on this earth. He wants to kill the seed. He wants to kill the seed on the inside of you. Point number two, he heard their cry. Look at Exodus chapter 2, verses 23 through 25. It came to pass in the process of time that the king of Egypt died and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage and they cried. And their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage and God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect unto them. He is moved by the cry of his children. The word mourn means to mourn or to gasp. They cried out. They cried for help. And God took notice of them. That's what the word means, to respect. God took notice of them. I don't know if you've ever found yourself in a weighted situation before where all you could do was to groan. Well, all you could do was to groan because of the desperation in your heart. Listen to me. The only thing worse than being in a desperate place is to never been in a desperate place. Because if you've never been in a desperate place, you might not have ever cried out. And had you not ever cried out, you might have very well been like the majority of people in churches. And what do they do? They sit their fanny in a seat each and every Sunday, each and every Wednesday, going through the motions of the tradition of religion and never really letting God grab a hold of their heart. And they just Skate on through. Lord knows we've all done it in here. Just skate on through acting like everything's okay. No, that's not okay. That's not good enough. God wants to do a work on the inside of us. And listen to me. When you find yourself in situations like that, where you feel that emotional disturbance taking place, God's setting you up for an opportunity for you to cry out to him. The enemy will cause us to serve him or try to cause us to serve him with rigor, harshness, severity, cruelty. And when that harshness and cruelty begins to have its way in our lives, the hope of God is that we will begin to groan and mourn in pain. Listen to me. If you're a child of God, don't waste that emotional turmoil and exasperation that you feel when you're becoming tired of sin or the situation and becoming tired of being a slave to the same old thing that keeps trapping you. No, use that emotion 
Amen. Use that emotion to cry out, to groan, and to cry out for help. Because listen, when they cried out for help, God respected them. God turned his eye upon them. God looked at them. You know, one of the things that I learned and I remember back from back when I was a drug head, <coughs> I can see a lot more clear today than I could back then. Amen. I thank the Lord that he delivered me from that. I mean, dude, I was yes. jacked up. But listen, you know what my mindset was? It was everybody else's fault but mine. Yeah. I made horrible decisions each and every day of my life. That is like a culture of sin. Listen to me. And it's not just in drug addict lives. It's also just in people in, in people's lives in the church. We have this mentality, this entitlement mentality that we think people owe us something. Yes. And that's just a trade-off from the world. It's two different opposite things. Listen to me. I was thinking about this this morning. When I was in, drug, in the life of drugs... Then I thought something was owed to me. I don't know how ridiculous, how I got that ridiculous mindset, but it, but it did. I felt like everybody owed me something. And every time something bad happened, it was everybody else's fault but Matt's. And you know that that same lie comes, has filtered into the church? I'm just right here to tell you through some of that prosperity gospel. I can remember when the first day the Lord rebuked me in my heart. He said, how dare you? You think just because you're the child of God and the righteousness of God that everybody deserves, that everybody owes you something? Boy, you need to get your head screwed on right. I want to bless you to the point where you can bless other people. Amen. Amen. Listen to me, everybody. Yeah, okay, I'm, I'm just saying, like, I, I, got a, I got a friend. He might have a business. I might need some help from him. He, gonna, he said, I'm going to help you out, brother. You're my friend. I'm going to give you the special deal. Well, good. Praise God. I thank the Lord that I'm going to get the special deal. But also know in the back of my mind, it's okay if, if, if the special deal includes somebody else getting a little something, something on the side. Because guess what? Oh, other people got to eat. And if I just can't, I understand that God's got a blessing that he wants to flow. But I also understand that people got to put food on their table. I also understand that I'm supposed to, God wants to build me up big enough to where I can carry my own weight. God wants to take care of me. The man that doesn't work is worse than an infidel. You're not to owe no man anything. God wants to produce his work ethic in me. Listen to me. I know that this is kind of like an analogy, but Jesus never quit. That's right. Jesus never quit. He carried that cross all the way up the hill. He went through with the Father's will. And sometimes life might try to weigh you down. But you, if you bear the name of the Lord, it's a poor testimony if you're always having to borrow and take from somebody else. No, God wants to raise you up. He wants to give you mental stability. He wants to give you physical stability. He wants to give you emotional stability so that you can get up in the morning. Quit hitting the snooze button. Get up in the morning. Get to work on time. And go to work and be the most productive person on the job. We need to quit making excuses. We're the child of the king. We got the spirit of God living on the inside of us. Oh, hallelujah. You can make you the best worker at the place. Right? If you're supposed to be knocking on doors, get up and knock on doors. Quit making excuses, man. I... I was reading through the Proverbs the other day. It said the sluggard or the fool has said in his heart that there's a lion in the streets. And so he turns over and he goes back to sleep. Ain't no lion in the street, man. Get up and go to work. Always coming up with some new excuse on why you can't get out there and do it. Ain't no lion in the street. Get up and go to work. Help us, Lord. I don't know where that came from. That was just free for you. But whenever you find yourself in a situation where you're crying out and you're desperate, God will take respect to that. His eyes roam looking for someone that has a broken and a contrite spirit. Point number three, we need to know his name. Amen. Exodus chapter six, verse two, we need to know his name. God spoke unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty. But my name, Jehovah, was I not known to them. And I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. You know, the main emphasis, I've said it already, but on Yahweh or Jehovah is that he is the promise keeping God. He's the covenant God. Amen. To Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he mostly showed himself as El Shaddai. He was the provider God. He is the all-sufficient one. That's what El Shaddai means. It means the all-sufficient one. Everything that you need, God has it and it's available to you. Yes. God provides, but he's not only the God that provides, he's also the God that keeps promises. Amen. And if he said that he can do it, he can and he will do it if we will let him. He's wanting us to cooperate with him. 
I like these words. This is what he was saying about himself. This is part of who his name is. This is part of the promise keeping God. You ready? In verse 1, I don't even know what these chapters are. I think it's all in this same chapter right here, Exodus 6. This is what he said in verse 1. See what I will do to Pharaoh. Verse 2, I am the Lord. Verse 6, I will bring you out. Verse 6, I will rid you out of their bondage. Verse 6, I will redeem you with a stretched out arm. Verse 7, I will take you to me for a people. Verse 7, I will be to you a God. Verse 8, I will bring you in unto the land. I am that I am. I am from the beginning to the end. I am the God that keeps promises. And what I said I will do, I will do. I am the author of your life. I began the work and I will bring it to completion. Hallelujah. And then the sad part. And Moses spoke so unto the children of Israel, but they hearkened not unto Moses for anguish of spirit and for cruel bondage. They've been living so long as slaves they hearken not to the word of the Lord. Now, by the grace of God, I am going to start focusing on my own life. You hear me? Listen, I'm here as a pastor, and part of a pastor's position is to be there for you. I get it. I got the calling. I'm all in. All right? You need something? Give me a holler. I will get back to you. Sean, I'm sorry that I didn't call you back. <laughs> Give me a holler, and I will get back to you. But you know what I'm starting to realize, too? As much as I love my own children, as much as I love other people, as much as I know Robert loves other people, the Lord's been showing me the same thing, and Robert and I have been kind of talking a little bit and praying for people. One of the things that I realized, though, is this, is that I still got to wake up tomorrow morning and serve the Lord for myself. Amen. I got to have the mindset that I'm going to wake up to, I hope my daughter follows along. I hope she gets to the place. I'm just using her as an example right now, but you got your own person in your life or your own life. Amen. Come on, somebody. Don't be judging the pastor's daughter Amen. when you got your own stuff up in your own life, right? God. She got to choose Jesus for herself. He's the, he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Matt. He needs to be the God of her. Right. What I'm trying to say is, is that she got to wake up one day and cry out in desperation in the midst of her misery so that she can find God for herself. <laughs> At the same time, I can only carry you so far, boo. That's right. I'm just being real. At some point in time, I got to wake up in the morning and say, I got to serve Jesus for myself. The enemy still wants to kill me too. He said, well, you got to wake up in the morning to serve Jesus for yourself. All this stuff about the pastor supposed to carry the whole church to glory. No, that ain't going to work, my friend. That's not what the Word of God says. The Word of God says you need to find Jesus for yourself. I, my job is to teach you about Jesus. My job is to expose Jesus from the Scripture. My job as a teacher is to feed the sheep and to let you know that there is a God of glory that sent His Son Jesus to die for you. And if you will surrender and cooperate with the Holy Ghost, you will see a flow of grace in your life. He will pick you up. He will strengthen you. And it doesn't matter how long you've been enslaved. It doesn't matter how long you've been weighted down and oppressed. God will begin to deliver you and bring you out of that. Hallelujah. Listen to me, that's a whole lot better deal. That's a whole lot better deal to have a preacher that wants to truly teach you Jesus so that you can connect to him for yourself than to have some preacher that wants you dependent on him. Because I am not El Shaddai. You know, one of, the, one of the words for El Shaddai, I'm not trying to get weird on you, it just is what it is. The, the, the mini, the full-breasted one. Because he was the provider. This is not the full-breasted pastor. You can't feed off of this man. He ain't nothing but a man of God. He's just a simple vessel. He's a mar a marred lump of clay that God spoke, breathed into, and chose. I wasn't even looking to be used by God. I was in a barroom bathroom, all broke, busted, and disgusted when the Lord spoke to me and said, You will present my word for the way it is written, and then I will use you. I didn't even know what that meant. But by the grace of God, I'm moving forward, and I want to present his word. Listen, there have been a whole lot of hiccups and speed bumps along the way, but by the pray, by the glory of God, Amen. Yes. by His grace, yes. I'm going to hold on, man. I don't want to take my hand off the plow. Amen. I want to. I want to hear those words. Yes. I want you yes. to hear those words. Amen. Believe it or not, I love you. Amen. I may not be able to hang out with you all the time, but I love you. I love people. Why? Because Jesus loves people. And when that same spirit that was in Jesus lives on the inside of you, you're going to learn how to love people. Amen. You might be frustrated sometimes with people. Yeah. Come on. Is it okay to be real? Yeah. But that's your flesh. That's my flesh. Yeah. Got to recognize that. Yeah. That's not the spirit of God. Amen. No. Lord, help us yeah. to be hungry to do your will. You said it is my meat to do my father's will. 
Help us, Lord. But they hearkened not unto Moses for anguish of spirit and for cruel bondage. Look at this, point number four. I'm closing with this. <coughs> he gives his people power over sin. We don't have to go there, but in chapter four, if you'll remember, Moses went to the Lord. He said, they're not going to believe me. Yeah. They're going to say, God didn't show up to you. God didn't reveal himself to you. How am I going to prove to them? He said, you see that? What do you got in your hand right there? A rod, that rod, throw it down on the ground. What happened when he threw that rod down? It turned into a serpent. It turned into a snake. He said, reach down there and grab that thing by the tail. What did he do? It turned back into a rod. See, the rod represents the authority that was given to Moses. Then he said, if they don't want to believe that, then what you're going to do is you're going to take your hand and you're going to stick it in your bosom right here. You're going to pull it out and you're going to show it to him. It's going to be leprous, white as snow like leprosy. And then you're going to take it and you're going to stick it back in there. And you're going to pull it back out and it's going to be normal again. It's going to be the color of the rest of your flesh. You know what leprosy represents? It re represents sin. You know what the snake represents? It represents the author of sin. What this word in my heart is showing me is that God's saying, listen, I'm in control. I have power over sin. I have power over the serpent that authored sin. And I'm here to tell you that I can reverse the curse of sin. And if you will learn to trust in me, and if you will speak the truth to my people and they will believe me, then they're going to know that I sent you. Then they're going to know that I have a word for them and I have hope for them. Listen to me. I'm here to tell you something this morning. I don't care what you're facing and I'll keep preaching it till I ain't got no more breath left in my lungs. The word of God says that you and I have victory over the power That's of right. sin through what Jesus has already done. Look at Romans chapter 8 verses 1 and 2 and I'm closing with this. It says there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Are you in Christ this morning? Yes. I got a question for you. you know, well, I don't know, preacher. What does it mean to be in Christ? It means that you received him as your Lord yes. and Savior. It means that you came to the realization that you were a sinner and that you needed the sacrifice of Jesus to pay the penalty of, our, of your sin. Are you, is that you this morning? Amen. Have you asked Jesus into your yes. heart? Because listen to me, if you have it, I got to tell you something. I don't even know that we have music to play for an altar call, but we don't need music. Amen. What we need is the Holy Spirit. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to offer you an opportunity to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior this morning in case you have it. And listen, if you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you know what the Word of God says? It says you're in Christ. The old man that was born in sin of Adam the first time gets born again. Yeah. When the Holy Spirit reveals truth to you, amen, and you received Jesus by faith in the spiritual realm, the old man that you were died with Jesus, was buried with Jesus, and now you've been resurrected yeah. to Jesus, yeah. and your new life is in amen. Christ. Hallelujah. They get into some music amen. together. Yeah. Amen. Amen. They get us some music together so we can have music and the Holy Spirit. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Listen, you're, there's no more condemnation to them which are Amen. in Christ. Amen. Praise God. You, you, don't know, you don't have to live under a cloud of guilt anymore. You don't have Amen. to live under That's the oppression right. of your enemy yeah. anymore. I'm here to tell you what the Word of God said. The Word of God says you are free. Amen. The Word of God says you are no longer guilty. Are we going to believe what the Word of God says? Yes. He says to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. Listen to me, child of God. If you keep giving in to the flesh, you are going to feel like you are condemned. You are going to feel like you are oppressed. But if you will walk according to the Spirit and believe that you truly are set free, then i got to tell you that there's some laws that are going to kick into gear. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. You see, that's why you couldn't get free. You were under the, you were under a law of sin and death. The power of sin had you, but the power, but by the grace of God, the law of sin and death can, is no longer your king. 